welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. You can follow me on Twitter at XBorderTax. This week, we're back in the D.C. studio where I'm joined by Laura Valestin. Laura is a newly admitted international tax partner in our Washington National Tax Services practice. Laura, welcome to the podcast and congratulations on your admission to the partnership. Thank you very much, Doug. Well, Laura, you either have the the honor or I'm not sure how to refer to it as being one of our foreign exchange and foreign cor- currency gurus. <laughs> How do you respond to, like, what do you do for a living? Actually, what I tell people is it's the area of tax that nobody wants to know about, and they hear about currency, they hear about derivatives, they hear about debt, they just say, I have no interest, I those things confuse me, I don't want to do them, and I say that's what I do for a living. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right, and you are the, the guru in this particular area, so I'm, we're going to try to stay somewhat out of the weeds, but what I really like to do over the course of today's podcast is really just try to take down some of those misconceptions, issues with this scary code provision called Section 987. And I try not to talk too much about specific code sections here on cross-border tax talks, although I don't do a very good job at that. But <laughs> maybe before we dive into section nine, before we dive into some of the regs and the various proposed regs that have been over the course of the past 20, 30 years, first of all, what is section 987? What's its intention? And it's a it's really just, you know, a relatively short code section. It it is. And and honestly, it's just basically one sentence. Um, That's it in the code with a whole bunch of proposed regulations and some final regs that aren't yet effective that are out there. Um, But essentially what it gets at is if you have a company that's operating with foreign branches, um, with disregarded entities, um, even partnerships, they're operating in a different currency than their owners. There's obviously some inherent currency gain or loss because of the fact that those operations are being operated in a different country and and you're reporting them in a different currency than the owner and so what 987 does is essentially it tries to capture the currency gain or loss between the fact that your owner could be u.s dollar for example and you're operating a branch in europe in euros and it's trying to capture that that currency gain or loss from the difference of i'm operating in one currency versus my owners in a different currency and i have to report in a different currency and for those people that look at financial statements and they're trying to compare what tax does to what book does, um, on the gap side of things, they call that translation gain or loss. Right. So. Yeah, we, we, we've talked some about that on, on cross-border tax talks, specifically as we think about Section 965, which is the, the toll charge, mm-hmm. right? And then Subpart F, which now includes this whole new provision called guilty, which we've spent a lot of time talking about. But the way I kind of think about Section 987 is not dissimilar from the foreign exchange gain or loss that we see on previously taxed income. In other words, right. the, the general point is, is that companies operate in the non-U.S. dollar, non-functional currency environments. They'll recognize income for U.S. tax purposes. And then from the time that that income is recognized and then when there's been some sort of either remittance, which is what we talk about in Section 987, right. or a distribution of PTI or a distribution of PTEP in the context of the toll charge or in the context of guilty or subpart F, that the, the tax law, the U.S. tax system, wants to capture and understand the economics of that foreign exchange gain or loss from the time that income was recognized to the time that that cash was actually distributed, for example, or that there exactly was some right. other recognition event. Exactly right. And, and it's interesting because you've got 987 is essentially capturing when you're, when you're operating in a branch form or disregarded entity or partner, some type of flow-through entity. It's trying to capture the difference between well, I'm picking up that income as it flows through at one rate, but as it is distributed at another rate, there's a currency gain or loss component to that. And so it has mechanics for how we pick up that currency gain or loss component. Similarly, when you're thinking about how you have tiered corporations, right? You've got CFCs right. that are, are operating and you've got distributions out of those. That, that's another foreign, foreign currency provision. So you've got 986C. That'll capture the fact that you are operating in a corporate form and there is, again, a corporate form, usually euros, Japanese yen, some other non-USD uh, currency that you're operating in. 986C is 
the corporate mm -hmm. provision to get the FX gains or losses on any distributions of PTI, subpart F. Um, it, it's just basically mimicking it. 987 is saying if I'm operating in some kind of flow through entity, 987 will capture the, capture the currency gain or loss. If I'm operating in a corporate form, 986C will capture the gain or loss. Right. And the 987 applies irrespective of what type of owner that we have of the QBU, right? So we right. can have, you know, a U.S. corporate shareholder, for example, that holds branches. It could be a controlled foreign corporation, okay. for example, that holds branches, a partnership, or even a, a, a single member LLC, for example. So 987 can apply in any of those particular contexts. It, it really can. And and one thing I think that catches people is we usually, and even you and I as we started talking, we said, you know, if you're operating in a non-USD currency, 987 will apply. It can actually occur, too, where you have a controlled foreign corporation, a CFC, that is a euro functional currency that has foreign branches that are operated in dollars or Australian dollars or yen. 987 will apply there because the owner is operating a different currency than its branch or its disregarded entity, and 987 will apply in that relationship as well. So let's dive into to some of the mechanics, because this is what really, I think, gets so complicated yes. with Section 987, is as we talked about, the Internal Revenue Code provision is really just one sentence, but it gives the Secretary of the Treasury broad authority to be able to draft regulations to actually tell us how this applies. And because we're dealing with disregarded entities and QBUs and effect, effectively, I would like to call maybe synthetic entities from a tax perspective mm -hmm. that particularly if you're operating in a in true branch form, not necessarily a disregarded entity, that you need to understand, well, what's the balance sheet? What's the P&L of something that maybe doesn't really even exist from a legal perspective? So right. that the mechanics of understanding how to determine what that foreign exchange gain or loss is and when it's recognized are all in various regulations. And so these regulations, I think the first set of proposed regulations were back in 1991. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I started practicing in 1999, this was actually one of the very first things that I had to research as a new lawyer <laughs> at, uh, at PwC. And um, I remember there was a particular article that I spent a bunch of time studying and, and learning uh, about those rules from one of the from a, another practitioner. Um, and then we got some new proposed rules in 2006. And yeah. then there has been a series of final and temporary regs that we had in 2016. In May, so just a few months back, we got some final regulations. And I think maybe you are more more attuned than I was, but I was like panicked, like, holy cow, we got the final 987 regs. <laughs> Everybody had that reaction. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't just me. And then it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Those are just very limited as yes. far as what they actually finaled. Yes. But let's go back to, to 1991 and give us a little bit of context as far as, you know, the 91 regs and the 99, and we don't have any, or the 91 regs and then and the 2006. Two, two, 2006. We really don't have any final regs at this point, too. So give us a little context uh, and some of the key differences. Yeah, definitely. And this is where I start. Anybody that has never really dove into what is 987, I always give them the lay of the land. And they say, look, you have the statute that was in 1986 that came out. That's our effective legislation right now. And just like you said, gave a lot of legislative authority to the secretary so they could write regulations. And they did that. So in 1991, they put out the first set of proposed 987 regulations. And when they did that, they were really trying to mimic what, what uh, was happening from a financial statement perspective, and they went on, they call it an equity and basis pool methodology. Mm -hmm. Essentially what they were doing is that the mechanism under 1991 said everything on the balance sheet is going to generate currency gain or loss. So what we will do is as owners of these what we call QBUs, qualified business units, and what I would say is I tell people think of your flow through entities the branches, the disregarded entities, the partnerships. When you think QBU, those are the types mm -hmm. of entities you're looking for in this context. And you are essentially tracking your equity in those entities, so the net equity, your balance sheet. And you're tracking what's your basis in that balance sheet in the QBU's functional currency, and then what is your the owner's basis in that same equity. And as you bring up portions, remit is what they call it, remittances, mm -hmm. as remit some of that equity, you are going to bring along with that remittance some currency gain or loss, and that is the 987 gain or loss that the owner will pick up. And so that was what 91 was doing. The issue was, and the reason they came up with a new set of proposed regulations, was because the IRS started to have 
a lot of 987 losses coming through. So what ended up happening is taxpayers, they had these, they had the laws, and they realized that they could make these remittances trigger large 987 losses because at that time, what was happening is the dollar was a, was strengthening against mm-hmm. these foreign currencies, and so it was generating a lot of losses, and it was pretty easy to make distributions, remittances that would trigger the losses. The IRS started seeing this and seeing you know, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in 97 loss and said, wait a minute, we think there might be something wrong with these regulations. Let's go back to the drawing board. And so they asked the IRS and and Treasury to write some new regulations. And that's where the 2006 proposed regulations came in because they perceived abuses with the 91 regulations. Yeah. And maybe before we dive into the 2006 and just spend a little bit more time on, on the 91 regulations. So, you know, I just kind of put that in context. So the 91 regulations, that was before check the box, right? So you Plus, mentioned disregarded entities, but those fundamental rules really applied in, in true kind of branch form. So yes. this was before, you know, the birth of the check the box rules. And then I think, as you mentioned, you know, as those rules came in, was that 96 or 97? Mm-hmm. It was, but I think yeah, before I think both of us started practicing. It was. <laughs> but but uh, hopefully not many of our listeners will probably remember when, when, when those came out. But uh, obviously that really changed the game and made the, dis- the concept of a disregarded entity and kind of operating in branch form for U.S. tax purposes, even though you're operating in corporate legal form from a foreign perspective, I think it made a lot just a lot more common. It did. And I, d- I don't think when they put the 91 out, be- the 1991 proposed regulations, they weren't even thinking about check the box because they didn't, right. like you said, they didn't, they didn't exist. It. And so it became a lot easier once the check the box regulations came out for people to fall under these 987 regulations. And because of the way they were written, they were doing something we call daily remittances, daily con- the daily netting convention. So on a daily basis, as you were putting, contributing money into this QBU, and then taking money out, you would figure out, did you have a remittance on a daily basis? So I could literally put money in one day, the next day take that same money and distribute it out of the QBU, and then technically under these rules, that was a remittance that could trigger the loss. Even though economically all I did was put it in one day, take it out the other, really didn't have that much of an economic impact. Right. That's what the IRS saw that they, they disliked. Right. And obviously most tax, you know, taxpayers can't control the currency markets right. and they don't know the how the FX is going to, to move. Obviously we joke if they did, they wouldn't be in tax, right? They'd be <laughs> I've doing, used that a lot. <laughs> we'd be doing something else if people knew how that worked. But the fact was, was that they, companies would look for late or, or taxpayers would look for latent foreign exchange losses. Mm-hmm. And the way those rules were enacted, that remittance would generally trigger the loss. And there was right. no sort of uh, rules that would generally prevent that that transaction from, from being lost. And that was an ordinary loss too, right? Right, right. Ordinary, there was nothing abusive about it. It was just the way that it was written. It was very easy for people to trigger these losses. And because of how the currency markets worked, again, taxpayers had no control over that. There just happened to be very large 97 losses. I don't know, you know, I'm speculating here, but had the dollar been weakening against all these currencies and we had massive 987 gains, maybe history would have come out differently and we would have had different types of regs, or maybe they would have kept the 1991 regs as is and finalized them. You know, we never know. And for those, those, currencies, maybe not a lot, where there there was, you know, some of the strengthening vis-a-vis the dollar where we potentially had gain, taxpayers could generally manage that by just not triggering the remittance, right? right? So there were things that you could do to still get access to the cash, but then not actually technically have a remittance to be able to create the gain. So to your point, taxpayers would trigger losses, get an ordinary loss, back in the 35% plus state tax environment, and uh, obviously significant amounts of, of losses. And right. so, okay, so then Treasury said, all right, maybe we should move away from this 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 method, this kind of equity kind of balance sheet approach. And then how did uh, the 2006 proposed regs potentially change the game? Right, so, so essentially they were saying, again, 91 was saying everything on your balance sheet is going to generate currency gain or loss. And the IRS and Treasury looked at that and they said, maybe that's a bit too broad. Uh, maybe we should be looking at this as only certain types of assets and liabilities are going to generate currency gain or loss, and we'll come up with a methodology for how we can isolate that currency gain or loss. And so I'm going to go very high level because the 2006 methodology is, is, is very complex when you're applying it, but essentially what it is doing, it is a mechanism that does several steps that essentially is isolating currency gains and losses 
that are occurring each year only with respect to financial assets and liabilities. So if you think about that, that's going to be your your accounts receivable, your payables, your cash. That is what they were really getting at as saying those are the items that are going to generate currency gain or loss. And what we'll do is we came up with a system that essentially backs into that number. Um, and for those listeners, if you're interested, essentially you're going to start with your change in the balance sheet. They call that your, your change in owner's value. They'll get the change in your balance sheet for that year. And then if you think about what goes into your change in your balance sheet, which is your change in equity, what's impacting equity is going to be any types of contributions or distributions that you do during the year. So they back those out. Then it's going to be any income or loss during the year that runs through equity. Back that out. Mm -hmm. And then essentially what you're left with, and this is, again, very high level, but essentially what you're left with then after you back all of those out is just currency movement with respect to financial assets and liabilities. Because the other thing they did, and this is what a lot of taxpayers are, are having issues with, is they said, when we look at the balance sheet and we translate the balance sheet under this method into the owner's functional currency, and then we take the difference between the beginning and the ending balance sheet, we will translate the financial assets and liabilities at the spot rate at the end of each year. Mm -hmm. So we can watch the change in that rate year over year. But for other assets and liabilities that we'll call historic assets and liabilities, so think of that as your, your inventory, your property, plant, and equipment, for example, um, those are going to be translated at your historic rate. Whatever rate, the, if the historic rate is the, the exchange rate on the date that you put in place that asset, right. placed it in service into your, you know, your books and records. And every year, that asset will be translated at that same rate. So there is no currency fluctuation then because it's being translated at the same historic rate year after year. So by doing that and saying historic assets are translated only at this historical rate, mm -hmm. marked assets are what they call the financial assets and liabilities are gonna be translated at the year and spot rate each year. And then we'll take that difference between end of year balance sheet and beginning of year balance sheet after you've translated them at these specific rates, back out distributions, contributions, income and loss, anything else that's running through the equity account that has nothing to do with currency, once you back all of that out, what you're left with is essentially currency gain or loss on financial, financial assets and liabilities. Now, saying that conceptually may not sound terrible, and it might be like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense, which it, it does. Mm -hmm. But in practice, that's not how the books and records are kept for companies. Right. People are not, from a financial statement perspective, tracking historic rates, doing depreciation at historic rates. If you think about that, every asset that you place in service, you translate at historic rate, then you take the depreciation at that hist same historic rate. You have thousands of assets. Your system is not set up to do that. So then what ended up happening, I'm jumping a little bit here, mm -hmm. Doug, but what ended up happening is when the Trump administration came in, they said, let's look at some of these regulations and let's look for some that are burdensome to taxpayers. And so they came up with a list, and the 2006 987 proposed regulations was on that list. Because I they, remember. Yeah, they said, this is just too much. This is too much to ask our taxpayers to do. We want you to once again go back and see if you can come up with a different system and fix this because this is too hard. So now what we're left with is we've got our 91 proposed regulations, you've got the 06 regulations, and now you've got the Trump administration saying, let's come up with something different. Um, and so that's why they're, they're revisiting them. Um, in the meantime, between the Trump administration coming out and saying do something different, what they did in 2016 is they actually finalized those 2006 regulations, but they didn't make them effective yet. So what they did in 26, at the end of the year, so December of 2016, and a lot of taxpayers will remember this because it was right at the end of the year for a lot of companies, a lot of pain and, and a lot of longer hours trying to figure out from a financial statement perspective the impact the final regulations were going to have not from a tax return perspective but on their financials and doing right. their deferreds so in december of 2016 they finalized uh the 2006 regulations and they also came out at the same time with um, temporary regulations which were these essentially the biggest component of the temporary regulations were anti-abuse rules that came in and said look when you have certain terminations, we'll call them terminations of your QBU. So the businesses cease to exist or you've transferred them between owners so they're no longer held by the same owner. These anti-abuse rules came in and said, in certain situations, we're not going to let you recognize 97 gains and losses. Um, so they came out with this package in 2016 and then shortly after they had finalized or come out with a final on the temp um, 
regulation package, that's when the Trump administration came in and said, whoa, 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 we're, we're not sure we're okay with you finalizing these 2006-2016 regulations. They're burdensome. Let's go back and, and think about this um, and come up with maybe a different system. So that's kind of where we are at the moment is trying to come up with another system. So, so what rules uh, apply then? So as a, <laughs> as a taxpayer, because I think you had said the, the, the final regs in 2016, actually they're, they're final, but they don't apply, but those regs aren't effective, aren't effective yet. Right. So talk a little bit about the, when would those be effective if, if, if taxpayers want to still rely on the 1991 proposed mm-hmm. regs? Because one of the things I want to talk a little bit about, Laura, is in the, in the 2006 regs, what, what creates a recognition event, too, sure. and then whether it's subpart F versus not, we can get into. But before we even get into some of those mechanics, like which, which rules apply? And right. I, I, I still get confused about this, which is why I call you to say, OK, well, you know, the taxpayer taken this position with one QBU and maybe took another position with another QBU and maybe with a third QBU has done absolutely nothing. You know, the That's ostrich common. approach, which is not that <laughs> uncommon, just head in the sand. All right. We haven't recognized any FX, but wh- how? How do taxpayers determine which which applies? Yeah, so they're living in limbo right now, um, essentially. So where we are currently today is we have our statute still. That's effective. And that tells us we have to pick up gains and losses on a remittance basis. But the statute doesn't define a remittance. That's where we have to look to the regulations, Mm -hmm. which, again, only and the only regs that are final are the, the limited regulations that were finalized and a portion that are effective right now are the anti-abuse rules. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that's actually effective, the statute and the anti-abuse rules. That's it. After that, what we're left with is, okay, we have to do something reasonable until we have final effective regulations. And right now, the way we interpret what could be considered reasonable for applying 987 is essentially we think there's three real methods that people could be using. Um, and the first methodology is still under the 1991 approach. We still look to that and say, look, we think that's reasonable until there's something that comes out and tells us that's unreasonable and we have some other rule and mechanism that we have to, have to apply. We think it's still reasonable to apply 91, and a lot of taxpayers do that. And that's the equity and basis pools. Yes. And frankly, I think the reason a lot of taxpayers do that is because we set up those spreadsheets back in the day. They've and, always used that, right? And, and we've just tracked it. People have used it, and it's frankly a lot more administrable yes. than the 2006 regs, albeit it can sometimes result in some interesting – uh, particularly on the balance sheet and companies that are capital intensive, you can end up with some pretty big foreign exchange gain or loss on the balance sheet items. Very much so. But then I would say to, to that point is, but you still have the anti-abuse rules coming in. So while you can have remittances and they are not impacted by the anti-abuse rules, you can't just terminate them and suddenly trigger a loss. It's much harder to do that. Um, so you're still, even though you could follow the 1991 regulations and that equity and basis approach a pool a pooling method, they're still subject to the anti-abuse rules. Got it. Um, those are still going to be effective right now. Um, then there's another method that we haven't mentioned, which is called the earnings only method. And that is essentially um, derived from the 1991 mechanism, where it was a creature, I'd say, of the accounting firms, actually. Mm-hmm. It was an interpretation of the statute. If you look at the statute, it says that you pick up the remittances based on your earnings. And so there was a system that was created that said, well, we have these equity and basis pools that we create, that the equity and basis pools under 1991 include earnings and capital. It's your total net equity. But the statute tells us that you pick up remittances in 97 based on earnings. So under earnings only, there's actually four pools that you create. You keep earnings only pools, so just tracking your earnings in the QB's functional currency, earnings in the owner's functional currency, and as you do distributions, anything coming out of the earnings pool will trigger 987 gain or loss. And then on the side, you have your capital pool. So as you're making capital contributions, Mm -hmm. you will track your historic basis in your capital contributions. So you have your capital equity pool, which is in the QB's functional currency. You'll have your capital basis pool, which is in the owner's functional currency. And you track that so that if you're making distributions and they're in excess of your earnings, then you have to figure out what's the basis that comes out for that that's where you would use your capital pool because anything coming out of capital isn't triggering 987 under that method. It's just going to come up with a historic basis, 
And then when the owner sells it, you'll have gain or loss up at the owner level, right? Yeah, I think of it like a 301C2. So you've got a distribution first to the extent of E&P, mm-hmm. then the return of capital. Well, when you're distributing E&P, if you will, that's where you potentially have that FX where we started right. the discussion with. And then you need to figure out, okay, well, if we get into the, the return of capital, return of basis, how do we determine if we've got FX on that as well? Exactly, exactly. So that's where, and, and a lot of people will say miss on earnings only. They think of it as only tracking earnings because that's the 97 piece. They forget a lot of times to track those capital pools as well and so it usually ends up being an issue not so much as you're making just remittances over the years it becomes an issue a lot of times when you terminate a QBU Mm -hmm. and now everything is coming up so it's definitely going to exceed your earnings pools and then they go well what do I do with the rest and we have to go back and try to recreate the capital pools so you can get your basis but that's the earnings only method that people I'd say a lot of taxpayers use that one right Mm -hmm. now and then a few taxpayers I haven't seen a ton Honestly, that use the, the o, I'll call it 06 proposed method or the 2016 methodology. Mm-hmm. Just a few that are using that. Um, and I think, again, reasonable to use the method. But I'd say that most people are using the other two because, again, it aligns more closely with, with what they're doing for financial accounting purposes. So they already have the information available. It's easier to create your basis and equity pools, your earnings pools. Under the 06 slash 2016 methodology, some are using it, but it does mean that you're kind of creating a whole new set of books and records for the 987 calculation. So that's kind of where we're seeing the lay mm-hmm. of the land, is everybody's under one of these, typically one of these three methodologies or some hybrid of those methodologies. And then just again, to put a fine point on it, is you're subject to those methodologies and you use one of the three usually. And then overarching all of them are these anti-abuse rules. So when you have terminations, you have to be careful of, can you recognize the 97 gain or loss upon termination? Yeah, one of the the other, I think, big issues, particularly for those that have QBU sitting underneath CFCs, is whether that 987 gain or loss is triggers subpart F income. Right. I think under the, the 91 regulations, we generally believed that it would just create earnings and profits adjustments. Well, although I'm not sure that was free from doubt. Yeah, right? actually, if you look at all the proposed regs and in some way, they all had something that they said this this could this could create subpart F income, even under the 91 uh, regulations. It was still referencing that there could be uh, the 97 gain or loss could be subpart F income. What's happened, though, is because that has only been in proposed form and nothing effective yet. Mm-hmm. Taxpayers have taken the position that, well, until that's effective, there's nothing in the statute, there's nothing in the subpart F rules that tell me 97 gain or loss is subpart F. So until I have an effective regulation that tells me it's subpart F, taxpayers take the position it is not until that point. Now, right now where we stand is at the moment we have these final but not yet effective regulations, and the ones that were issued in 2016, and they're currently – um, for calendar year taxpayers, at least, going to be effective January 1st, 2020. So if nothing happens between now and January of 2020, starting January 2020, yes, 97 gains of losses um, should be considered, or a portion of them should be considered subpart mm-hmm. F income. Um, however, we're hearing rumors that they're, they're looking at, you know, possibly changing that. And again, that, be, that came from the Trump administration saying, I need you to go back, look at these regulations, make some changes. Treasury, that was October of 17. Um, that Treasury came out and, and responded to the Trump administration request and said, okay, we're going to look at these, we'll come up with something else, and they kind of gave us some ideas and hints that they are probably going to maybe come up with some taxpayer elections to let them maybe apply a simpler method, um, not the 2016 methodology, but there might be limitations then in terms of when you can take losses if you use the simplified method. Mm-hmm. That's all in the Treasury's response to the Trump administration request. So we're thinking we might see something between now and January um, either newly proposed regulations with these changes in them, or at least, if nothing comes out, at least another delay possibly in the effective date of the final regs. Yeah, and how this fits into the new guilty provisions and with the historic subpart F, yeah. just from a policy perspective, obviously very challenging. Most of the stuff that we talked about was obviously before the the TCJA. So just kind of makes my head hurt thinking about <laughs> how, how guilty and, you know, the fact that most of the income in the CFCs beyond, uh, you know, the, the 10 percent return on depreciable tangible assets is immediately subject to U.S. tax. And then where that foreign exchange gain or loss, particularly with QBUs, kind of fits into that. 
um, I can imagine is challenging for, for Treasury. Yes. All right, so another question that, that I get a lot, Laura, is what is a QBU? And <laughs> You know, we get lots of questions where particularly you've got holding companies and financing activities or, you know, a operation where you have just one person in a particular jurisdiction that's doing some sales and hasn't done any contracting. And is that a branch? And, yes. you know, um, maybe briefly, you know, <laughs> what what advice do you give taxpayers and practitioners that get that question? Like, what is a QBU and when should we when do we need to apply 987 to that QBU? Sure. Great question. We get it all the time. Um, it's very facts and circumstances based, which is which is why a lot of people have a headache and have those questions because there is no, you know, here's a formula, here's a mechanism, and a bright line test. Yes or no, you have a QBU. Rather, it the QBU definition we generally look to 989. So we look to the 989A-1 regulations, which defines a QBU, and in that definition, they basically say you have to have a trader business. So there's, in 989, they go into more, there's there's per se QBUs. So just because the type of entity, mm-hmm. tax entity classification you are, you are a QBU. Example, a corporation, an individual is a QBU. But then 987 goes further and says, yeah, but 97 is not going to apply to a corporation. It'll apply to this, these flow-through type entities. So you're looking at, again, disregarded entities, branches, partnerships. And so what you need to do under these proposed regulations is that it really wants you to go looking into what are the operations or are there any operations in these branches, in these disregarded entities, in these partnerships? And is there a trader business? And again, there's nothing that's bright line on what a trader business is either. So typically, you're looking for employees, even if it is just one employee. You're looking for employees. You're looking for some type of profit motive. Are they trying to make a profit? Is there some type of revenue in there? Is there some type of expenses in there? The one that the IRS has had a lot of issues with is holding companies. Mm -hmm. And they've said, well, look. And there's even an example in the 2016 and the 2006 regulations specifically on point that said, look, if you're a holding company, you you hold capital. You have stock in a CFC, for example. And you have a liability because you needed to borrow money so you could acquire that stock. And that's all you have. The example comes out and says that is not a QBU. Mm -hmm. You don't have a trader business if that's all you're doing. And so they're, they're right on point. They say no. So right now, what most people do then is they say, look, if I'm a holding company only, generally not going to treat that as a QBU. But it gets a little fuzzy if you're a holding company that has just a little bit more activity. Maybe you, you kind of start to look like a financing entity because you don't have just one liability. Maybe you have a couple intercompany loans here and there. And how many do you need in order to have that threshold to be a, a QBU? And that's where I have to say I can't say over the phone you know, or over right. the podcast that there's an, a bright line. But we look at those facts and circumstances and we find out, well, how big are those loans? How many are we talking about? How often do they turn over? Let's see if you start to look a little bit more like maybe a financing company so you have a trader business in there. Um, But again, facts and circumstances on that one. All right. So any last minute words of wisdom for for, for taxpayers or practitioners? It sounds like we're going to need to keep our you know, ear to the grindstone, listening to understand what Treasury and the Trump administration is going to do with these regulations or with the proposed and final regulations before they become effective 1-1-2020, which is quickly approaching, by the way. It is. And uh, so any advice or or predictions or or, or views on on what may happen on, on Section 987? So rumors that we've, we've been hearing, and because May they came out with the, they finalized the anti-abuse rules along with a couple other provisions, we're definitely hearing that Treasury is working on new 987 regulations or revisions to the 987 regulations. So I'd say definitely keep your, you know, your ears and eyes open for potentially something between now and year end um, for new actual regulations. I'm assuming if they make drastic changes and they put in new elections and such, I would imagine they would repropose them. Mm -hmm. So we may see something between now and year end um, that'll change that. And in the meantime, I'd say before those, just make sure that as you look and you see flow through type entities, your branches, your partnerships, your disregarded entities that are where the owner has a different functional currency than the branch or the the, um, disregarded entity, Make sure you're identifying that. Calling somebody if you're not sure. Call somebody Mm -hmm. for help and say, do I have 97 concerns here? Let's fix this now. Make sure I can get, you know, any exposures taken care of. 
Um, so that's all you can do between now and then and come up with some reasonable methodology rather than doing the, the ostrich in the sand approach. Yeah, that, that fourth, <laughs> the, the fourth method, which you did not me- method, or did not mention, which is the ostrich method, obviously is not a good method under no. any of these standards. No, not at all. I would not recommend that. All right. Well, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Laura Valesten, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Again, congratulations on your admission to the partnership. I'm thank very, you, Doug. very proud to have you as one of my partners. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks from our WNTS office, Laura Valesden, our foreign exchange and foreign currency guru. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's international tax services leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of Cross Border Tax Talks. 